So th this is this is a talk I wanted to get in because, um, and it may not even go the whole time it's supposed to go. We'll see. It, it's a pretty short talk. I really wanted to kind of squeeze it in though because these were features that actually went into our um, 2.1 release. So this is stuff that's been out for the last year. And I continually find very little realization that Bro has this support. Um, so f uh, as, as an example, and please correct me, Doug and Scott, if it's not true, but I don't think that the tunnels log is imported into ELSA in Security Onion. So yes, the, the, the tunnels log a year after its release is still not <laughs> it's still not being imported into ELSA in Security Onion. Um, I think these are kind of neat features, though, uh, especially because I, I feel like the approach that we took to them is, is actually fairly comprehensive from a logging and forensics perspective. Um, so I wanted to really point out the reason I stuck IPv6 and tunnels in the same presentation. It, the work for both of them was really done at the exact same time. Uh, John Sewick, again, did a lot of the heavy lifting on it, uh, and I, I, I did very minimal stuff. but. Um, they were sort of done at the same time, though, because most of the IPv6 traffic that, mm, not all of you, but some of you see on your networks, at least, is probably tunneled. And if you're not running Bro, you may not even know that you have it. So you may be having this tunneled traffic, people using Teredo, and you have no idea. People using 6 to 4, you have no idea. All these different protocols. So I think that um, at least at this point in time, and especially a year ago when it was released, um, IPv6 and tunnels were really sort of hand in hand because that was where all the IPv6 traffic you saw was from. Um, the reason also that I like having it in Bro is we have the ability to do forensic logging on it. A long time ago at The Ohio State University, I had started playing around in, and decapsulating IPv6 out of tunneled connections. So I was actually decapsulating quite a few protocols. and. Something I realized, I, I sort of took the, you know, the building block approach. I have this thing, I can decapsulate it here and send it over here and you know, do logs. So I actually was running uh, the Click Software Router. And I had written four custom elements or something. And I was actually strip, I would you know, identify Teredo. And I would strip the outer packet off. And I would sort of forward the IPv6 packet off to, uh, to my bro box. And it turned out that when I would look at the con log, I had no idea where that stuff had come from. It, it was not our IPv6 address space and not our IPv6 address space. I was like, I have no idea. I can't, I can't find out what host on our network this came from because we had lost all context, which was really sort of the, the push in bro for doing it in a unified manner where we could, we, we had that state and we had the information and we could actually build this back. But going into IPv6 more, um, this is stuff that I th we may have talked about some or at least mentioned on the mailing list and things. It used to be a configure option. In 2.0, it was a, still a configure option. You could optionally have IPv6 support. And we always told everyone, don't enable it because it'll make your server crash. <laughs> and it did. You, you, you would, your, your bro processes would crash if you ran IPv6. Uh, so we told everyone to turn it off, basically. But um, 2.1, it got fixed. And we really have had close to no problems since then, I, I don't think. I haven't heard of anyone having any problems with IPv6. What I like the most about the IPv6, IPv6 support that we have now is it's not exciting. There's nothing exciting about it, which is exactly how IPv6, IPv6 should be, in my mind. Absolutely nothing exciting about it. It looks different in your logs. There's the difference. So instead of you know, looking at a con log and seeing IPv4 addresses, now you see IPv6 addresses. It doesn't really matter from a, an analyst perspective. There are some subtleties due to the address space expansion that, that cha do change things. And those are good to keep in mind. But from the generic you know, just run bro and get logs, there's not really a whole lot that changes. And we did a lot of, of work on strange edge cases. Ashish complained incessantly. <laughs> Sorry, Ashish, to point that out, but you didn't stop. <laughs> um, we would implement something, and Ashish would dig into IPv6 and find something else and say, well, if you don't support this, you can't say you support IPv6. And then we'd fix that. 
And then the next thing, well, if you don't support this, you can't, you can't say you support IPv6. Eventually, he stopped complaining, which was really nice. But um, I, I feel like Bro's IPv6 support came out good from that. I mean, it, it was the best complaining anyone could have asked for. <laughs> so thank you. But um, it, you know, a lot of strange edge cases ended up being supported. Like you know, Bro digs through extension headers, and I, I think there's a notice. There's a lot of there's a lot of deeper stuff to IPv6 you can get information about that I'm unfamiliar with because I haven't even played with it that much. But a lot of work went into that to make it unexciting. Um, tunnels is the, the thing I really wanted to point out is everyone has tunnels. Does anyone in, has anyone in here seen, uh, that, that's running bro, seen a tunnels.log pop up in their bro installations? Yeah. It just sort of pops up. <laughs> it's, it's like the, the bro thing. If you don't see email traffic, you won't have an smtp.log, but the day someone does an e it does like a connection to an SMTP server and sends email, bink, that log suddenly appears, and you learn that day that you're analyzing SMTP traffic. <laughs> um, and tunnel stuff is like that. It's turned on by default. Um, basically, everyone has it. There, there's a number of different tunnel encapsulation mechanisms, but <clears throat> the one everyone really sees is Teredo because it's turned on by default and Windows, or sorry, I, I guess I shouldn't say that. I, I'm not totally clear on that, but there seems to be on everyone's network a couple boxes that are like, I don't need IPv6 and I'm not really going to use it, but I'm going to go ahead and establish a Teredo tunnel anyway. And uh, again, like I was saying, most tunnels are really for enabling IPv6 on end hosts. Most of the most of the tunnels are for that. Um, shipped with Bro 2.1, we have decapsulators for Teredo, which is the, the big one probably, and then we have IP and IP, which includes IP, or uh, sorry, six to four. But I believe that that support. I don't even know if John's in here. Anyway, oh, that's a generic IP and IP, right? Yeah, it's, so you could do four and six, or six and four, or four and four, or six and six. Like it, it just sort of supports any of that. Um, a YIA, <laughs> which is a um, a draft RFC that is ex that expired a number of years ago, but one of the big tunnel brokers still uses it. There's a tool that uses it, and so if someone uses that tunnel broker, you'll see a YIA traffic, and we support that by default. Uh, there's a GTP1, GTP v1. I don't know much of anything about that, but I've heard from Liam and a few other people that have seen that traffic that it works. Uh, SOX is the, the kind of oddball because SOX is actually a proxy protocol, and I don't know if everyone's familiar with the difference difference between a tunnel protocol and a, and a proxy protocol. A proxy tunnels content, a a tunnel tunnels. Um, uh, like IP packets. So it sort of tunnels the net, a tunnel is sort of tunneling the network. A proxy is saying, hey, you, can you connect me over there to that host? And then I'll talk to you, but it's like I'm talking to that host. So it's sort of like tunneling the content of, the, of a connection and not so much saying, you know, I want to just, you know, have this other network connection and be able to talk to all sorts of stuff. But we have, it, it was, it's, it's a little hacky internally, but it actually gets treated very similar to a tunnel. I am really going to be done early, so no one, get, no one be surprised. <laughs> so there's also tunnel recursion, and I, I, John, I believe, made some really crazy tests for this, where it, it's like three layers of tunnels. Is that what you had done? Yeah. So there's like three layers of tunnel. We have a test that actually tests three layers of tunnels. It, it is a test, actually, right? Yeah. So there's a test that actually tests to make sure that we can do recursion into like. Teredo six and four, or, uh, you know, six to four Teredo again, something crazy like that, which n you're probably never going to see, but just in case you do, it's there. It's, I think it's pretty similar to a few other features in Bro that we've tested, even though no one's ever going to see them. Um, and unfortunately, this is sort of ending, so you know, but I, I'll show some logs. Uh, from a forensics perspective, I wanted to show that the logs, again, like I was saying yesterday, we really try to approach the logging from a forensics perspective where the thing I hate the most is when you're digging into something and you hit a dead end before you got to the end. Um, 
So what this is is actually two, lo two log lines out of tunnel.log. One is a, tu a Teredo tunnel being established. So you can actually see the tunnel type is Teredo. The action is tunnel discover. And, and it has a unique ID for the connection that the tunnel is happening over. And then you see the bottom one. And you can see the timestamps. They're a little hard to read because they're in the epic time. But you see a little later, that's the that same tunnel, because it's the same connection ID, and same connection unique ID. And then you see it is a Teredo tunnel, and it's the tunnel closing. And in this case, I think the tunnel closed because the trace file ended that I was processing. Typically, I think what, hap what would happen with a Teredo connection, because it is UDP, it would actually be when the UDP mocked up connection in bro times out is when the tunnel would end because there's not really a good way of saying like this UDP traffic is done or something because it doesn't establish a connection. So then you can actually pivot from tunnel.log and you see the unique ID YQCEF, YQCEF, and then you have that in con.log. The, the one thing that I've found interesting, so con.log writes out that connection termination. So normally what would happen is, to go back briefly, you'll, ca you'll see tunnel.log, and you'll see this discover line. And you look in there, and you're like, OK, great. But there won't be, you won't find that connection unique ID in your con.log, because it hasn't, the connection's still going. It's just telling you, I found a Teredo tunnel, or I found a, a, I found a 6 to 4 tunnel, or I found you know, one of these other tunnel types of support. It'll say, I found it, but it won't log the connection yet. So you look in con.log, and it won't say anything. And it will actually log this con.log line and the tunnel close at the same time, because that's when both of those happen. But from a forensics perspective, if you're looking at like current data where a tunnel's still ongoing, it's nice having the log line that says the connection began. And I'll show you that in a second, why that's useful. So remember, YQCEF. So this happened, obviously, when the, at termination of the uh, the tunnel. And this, it, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. You know, it says it was 67 seconds long, approximately. The originator sent 100,000 bytes. The responder sent you know, almost 24,000 bytes. It was Teredo. Oh, yeah, and the, the service. So it actually tells you I attached the Teredo analyzer to it. This is where it gets a little more interesting. So you have that YQCEF down at the bottom, and you see tunnel parent. So that actually is indicating. This connection happened, but when you look at it, you see it's IPv6. And you say, but I don't have IPv6 on my network. Or maybe you say, I do have IPv6 on my network. And you look at those addresses. I looked those up. Both of those addresses are Hurricane Electric. And you say, I'm not Hurricane Electric. Where did this traffic come from? It can't have origin. It wasn't, you know, I'm not the originator. I'm not the responder. How did that traffic happen? And then you go, ah, tunnel parent. Hey, OK, this was decapsulated. So then you can, you know, in, in case this connection, the parent connection is still ongoing, so the Teredo connection is, is still established, or I'll say established, you actually go back and you refer to tunnel.log and you see, ah, there it is. It was host 99.241.86.237. That's the host that did that connection. And it just happens that it's IPv6 and not your address space. But at the very least, there's enough information that you can, if you get into a situation where you need to do forensics and find out what exactly happened there, you can work back through it. And the other thing, I guess I, I don't have a log for this, because this wasn't, um, this, in this case, what this was was a, a host that was actually doing BitTorrent over Teredo over IPv6. So this is a single, this is a single packet, and it was so, this was a host that had set up a Teredo tunnel, set itself to do BitTorrent over the Teredo tunnel, and the pa this is a single packet that it received, I th or maybe a few packets. So the originator of this connection was actually trying to connect to it as a peer on a BitTorrent swarm, whatever they call them. And I don't think it even worked, actually, or maybe it did. Just based on the number of bytes sent, it probably did work. But so this is essentially someone doing, and that's actually, thinking about it now, that, that's actually something you'll see primarily is people doing um, BitTorrent over IPv6. There's some BitTorrent client that actually supports you, like, click, and then it's doing 
it's doing BitTorrent over IPv6 because they're hiding from you. Except they're not anymore because you just looked at it. If the BitTorrent analyzer was actually not broken and we had it enabled, here it would say service BitTorrent and you would have a BitTorrent log. So you would be able to go all the way from BitTorrent log to the con.log to find this connection and then you'd say, oh, it's tunneled and you'd say tunnel parent and then you'd go back to con.log again for that tunnel parent line or you'd go to tunnel.log. So you actually can get back. And I mean, it's, it's sort of like the, the continuation of what I was talking about for the files framework yesterday. You could have a file transferred over a tunneled connection or a, you know, multiple tunneled layers of tunnels and you can actually work backwards through it in your logs. But I can certainly imagine looking at, if you had a, just a packet capture and you were looking through it with Wireshark or TCP dump, this would be really confusing. I mean, for one thing, you wouldn't see the BitTorrent in it, first of all. But secondly, it would just be horribly confusing because you'd have to follow back and you're like, I gotta remember that there's a tunnel and that it's this other address space and that it's doing BitTorrent and it all ties back up to this other tunnel that it's doing on the outside. It's just a lot to keep in mind. But this is the kind of thing that you could even write just little shell scripts on text logs that sort of pull it all back together and show you, oh, look, well, you know, like you're, I'm curious about this BitTorrent that happened and you'd say, you know, unique ID MY, whatever that next I, A, T. You'd say, I'm curious about that. And I could certainly see writing a shell script that would sort of work back and you know, draw it all out for you so you could see what had actually happened, tunnel into you know, BitTorrent and everything. <laughs> and seven minutes after this presentation was supposed to start, I'm pretty much done. Um, we can talk about it for a while, though, if you're interested. I don't know if they have lunch ready. What are, I, I really just wanted to reiterate that the reason I wanted to do this was to really make sure people were aware that this tunnel support is there. And I believe Vlad is actually working on a GRE tunnel decapsulator, too. I don't even see him in here anymore. Oh, you are, right? That's true. You know, okay, I'm not lying. Uh, but obviously, GRE, I think, can be encrypted or something, so you, know, you can always run into encryption. But I mean, generally, we have all of the structure in place that adding new ones is not a big deal. It's just, you know, parse the protocol, which Vlad is getting more and more familiar with. And you parse the protocol, you pass the data into the next level in Bro, and it just sort of goes with it. And the other thing I really wanted to point out is that normally you don't even need to care about any of this stuff because it's turned on and it works and it's there. The, the big thing to be aware of is that it is there and how to work back through the logs and that, for instance, that tunnel parent field. If you don't know that's there in your con.log, log, you may not even realize that it, you know, that, that it was a tunneled connection and that there is sort of this next layer you have to work up through in your logs. So are there any questions or anything? Yeah. Sure. So if you did have a BitTorrent log file with this conversation in it, um, which UID would show up in that log? And like, would it be IPv6 addresses or, or uh, IPv4 addresses? It would be, by default, the, uh, the top UID, the MYIA one, because that's the connection the BitTorrent was happening on. It just happened that that connection had a parent. And which set of IPs would you see? It would be the IPv6 addresses. It is something where if that was something that was interesting to you, you could extend these logs. I, I mean, it would have to be done per log at the current time, at least. Um, but yeah, I mean, our logs are so you can mold them to whatever you want. And it is something where you could say, ah, oh, is there a tunnel parent? And look up the connection and sort of dig back through that and just log it if you wanted. Um, but yeah, by default, you know, so you think of it, there's a tunnel, and then we kind of abstract that away, so then you're looking at this connection or connections happening over these over this tunnel. And those are the addresses that will get logged. And those are it's it's always gonna be focused on that because that's the connection. So um, could there be more than one IPv4 connection in the same IPv6 tunnel? Uh 
Yeah, so the way tunnels work is essentially it's just giving you a window sort of into another network. So yeah, I mean, nor in the normal case of people just doing a lot of tunneling, like they set up six to four and they go to Facebook and Facebook defaults to IPv6, it'll just go over the tunnel and you know there'll be lots and lots of connections. You'll just have a lot of connections with tunnel parents and the tunnel parent will always be the same unique ID. Yeah. Uh, the question was, you say tunnel parent, what other types of parents are there? None. <laughs> um, I, I think the reason we prefixed it with tunnel is to be clear that this is sort of decapsulating tunnels. Is there something else you have in mind that, that you could see using as parents? OK. The answer was no. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a little more verbose than it probably needs to be, but it, it is. <laughs> It's sort of a funny um, thing we run into continually with doing development on Bro is we have to come up with so many names for things that it, sometimes we, we do choose names that aren't even that great or, or could be abstracted a little bit better. But uh, most of the time in most networks, you know, tunnel parent is just set to null anyway, so it's not really a big deal. <coughs> Any other questions or thoughts? Thanks.